we're going to go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. My name is Andrea Wood. I'm um, head of development here at One Degree, and we want to welcome everyone to our Big Data to Fight Poverty webinar. And I want to um, talk a little bit about who you're going to hear on the um, presentation today. You have to pardon me. Pardon me. I have a little bit of a cold. Um, so I'm, uh, as I said, I'm Andrea. Um, I'm also going to be joined by Eric Lukoff, who's our Chief Technology Officer, and I also want to thank um, Anisha Nash and Adam Ray for helping uh, behind the curtains on the on the webinar today. So um, thank you for helping make this webinar successful, and thanks all of you for taking the time out today. I want to. Um, thank the James Irvine Foundation as well as the California Endowment Foundation for providing uh, the support for this analysis project. We use data routinely here at One Degree every day, but this is our first longitudinal formal study of our entire data set and um, that we're sharing externally and we're really excited to share it with all of you and also hear your thoughts and ideas and feedback. Some things to think about as you're listening to some of our findings. Um, can data help us make our work uh, serving families even more efficient? How might this kind of data help you in your role? Um, is there information that you wish that you had or um, for your own role or for your organization? And how might the safety, uh, the um, social services sector and put some of this information to work. So things to think about. And we wanna, um, we wanna emphasize that this is really meant as a discussion. We're really excited to hear your questions and ideas. Um, so please submit any questions that pop to mind as we're going through our presentation. Um, and you can do that by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many answers to those questions uh, and talk those through uh, during Q&A at the end. I also want to let everybody know that we are recording today's webinar, and we'll make the recording available um, in the next week following the webinar. And plus, please share. Um, we're using the hashtag Big Data for Good. And our handle on Twitter is at 1DEG, so please um, feel free to take screen grabs uh, or retweet. We're going to be tweeting from at 1DEG during our presentation today. So well, here's what's coming up. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the one uh, about One Degree as an organization. Um, and um, uh, then Eric, our CTO, is going to take us through uh, the mechanics of the platform and kind of how people use One Degree and who's using One Degree. And then Eric's going to share some of our search data findings. And then we'll talk about Q and A and uh, and next steps. All right, who we are. So a little bit of background about One Degree before we dive into our analysis and findings. So we were founded as a nonprofit organization. We're six years old. We have nine full-time staff and we're growing. Um, our core mission is to empower low-income people and families who are working to build a path out of poverty. And One Degree does this by building technology to help families discover and then access vital social services more easily. And I know all of us have recognized that we're facing some real urgency um, in our communities. There's growing inequality, there's a growing cost of living, um, and a growing homelessness crisis, and a cloud of hostile policies toward our most vulnerable, vulnerable neighbors and families. So um, a lot of this work uh, feels much more um, urgent than ever. So thank you all for all the work that you do and for joining us today. So currently, <clears throat> one degree is available to the population of all nine San Francisco Bay Area counties and Los Angeles County. And those 
two um, major metropolitan areas combined represent about 40% of California's population. And we're always actively looking for partners to bring one degree to even more communities, both inside and beyond California and our current region. So if you are joining from a region that we don't currently serve, please get in touch with us. Um, we would love to talk to you about expanding to um, your area as well. <clears throat> so today we're going to be talking about a lot of numbers and we've collected a lot of data. So we have the most comprehensive and up-to-date resource database with over 20,000 social services and resources um, available in the regions that we serve. Over 450,000 people have used the One Degree platform since we launched. We have over 3,000 nonprofit healthcare and social work practi practitioners who use the platform in their day-to-day -day work serving their clients. We have over a million data points about how our community is searching for help. So those are a lot of numbers, but the important thing to remember is um, these data points all represent the stories of real people. People like Seisha. So Seisha is a single mom who lives in East Palo Alto. She's been trying to climb the ladder of opportunity in a region of our country that's incredibly um, expensive to live in for low and middle income people. And Seisha used one degree to search for tenants' rights when she faced a potential eviction and she got help resolving her housing crisis. So while we're going to be walking through a lot of charts and graphs and numbers, um, it's really important to us um, that we all keep in mind that there are thousands of stories like Seisha's that are represented within, within the numbers that we're gonna be sharing today. As a nonprofit organization, One Degree receives a lot of support and um, funding from a variety of partners and uh, they make our work possible. So I wanted to make sure we gave them um, a shout out. So thank you to all of our partners and funders. And now I'm going to turn the reins over to Eric Lukoff, our CTO, to provide an overview of our platform and take us through uh, some of the, the findings. Thanks, Sandra, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, first, I just want to go over what our platform looks like and some of the basis for what we've built. So we've, we've built uh, what we call a platform, and I'll explain what that means to us in a second. And we built it so that anyone looking for help can find what they need and, and get access to it on whatever device they're using anytime. And our vision is to build a safety net for the 21st century. And we built our tech products in partnership with communities that we serve. And we've conducted um, hundreds of in-person prototype sessions with the community, with community members and have attended hundreds of events over the years. And we use um, these opportunities to uh, get feedback directly from the people that we're serving. Um, we we certainly um, this is a, a, just a, a quick view of a community event we were at recently. Uh, we uh, conduct lots and lots of uh, user interviews and research sessions and a prototype with people that we're serving. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about a lot of uh, about a lot of quantitative data today, but I just wanted to. Uh, show you that we also do uh, quite a bit of qualitative research uh, and on the ground uh, research with our community as well. Um, for us, a platform means that we uh, serve our community on a range of devices. So, so whether you're comfortable using a website or our mobile apps or texting with us or if you need a paper printout even uh, or you want to instant message with us or email with us, um, we're going to help you no matter where you are, uh, whatever wherever you are on your tech savviness level um, or whatever device you're comfortable with. Um, you can type in a keyword um, or, um, or text us and we'll reply with results. You can use our website and search directly yourself. You can pull out your mobile phone, download our apps, and get the help you need really quickly. This just uh, shows you a couple of different ways in which we serve um, the needs of our the spectrum of tech tech savviness levels. So if you're comfortable searching for resources, you can type it in yourself, or you can browse through our menus to find what you're looking for. Uh, we have 12,000 resources in the Bay Area that people can find and access, and we have 8,000 resources in the Los Angeles County area that we serve as well. 
And you'll notice when you are using one degree that we organize information by need and um, social service category essentially, but not by provider. Obviously you can search by organization or by provider as well, but we think it's more intuitive to present the information where the resource is first and foremost, because that's how most people are looking for information. Um, obviously professionals and practitioners uh, know a lot of jargon and they know potentially what organizations they're looking for, but low income uh, help seekers themselves may not know exactly what organization uh, they need to find or look up. Um, so we help we help them find it um, through their need. You can see we have uh, this is a quick view of our search results. Uh, we have, can search using our map. You can narrow results by hours or language or neighborhood, um, by zip code, or city, um, and um, a bunch of other ways to filter as well. And you don't need a login to or, or become a registered member to search for resources. We um, believe that everyone should have access to the information they need regardless of of how invested they want to become in, in as a one degree member in our community but if you create an account and you become a registered member we provide a higher uh, set of features higher level set of features um, allow people to um, add things to their plan and keep track of the resources that they're using and we help them track outcomes and we do that on the full spectrum of our of devices that uh, on which you can access one degree. And you'll note here, this is a quick screenshot of our Android app on the right, and it's fully translated into Spanish. Our whole platform is available on the full spectrum of devices in both English and in Spanish. And while we're, we've built our platform primarily for the public, for, so for help seekers themselves, we also have a number of tools built for social workers and community health workers and any professional who refers resources to a client or to families. And we give uh, professionals a special uh, level of uh, access and they can access uh, these features for free and makes it easy for them to track, make referrals and track them, um, see how their clients are doing. And um, we believe this helps replace the outdated paper binders or um, outdated records um, to track their, their client's progress. And we, we certainly provide our entire platform for free. And we also have um, a version of OneDegree that is a monthly paid service specifically for organizations who want a deeper uh, level of analytics and uh, reporting uh, information and integration with their own CRM and uh, some administrative features as well. Um, and if you're interested in that higher level of service, feel free to get in touch with us. We'd love to, love to talk to you about it. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what information we collect on our platform. So everyone using One Degree is certainly contributes to our rich information about uh, what they're searching for. And we collect this data mostly in the background, um, mostly and honestly through um, uh, what devices people are using, what operating systems such as Windows or Mac OS or uh, iOS, um, what date people are using um, our, our products and and at what times of the day, um, where people are, and uh, what categories they search for. Um, also, what categories they search for together. So, what are what are uh, what what categories have uh, relationships with each other, and um, whether or not someone searched in the search bar for for resources, or whether or not someone went to one of our predefined categories and searched search that way. Um, and then we also record uh, the frequency in which people are looking for resources and when, what times of the year. And then we've also surveyed our members to find more detailed demographic information about them, which we'll talk about in a second. And then I also want to emphasize that we are not a for-profit company. Um, there's a lot in the news right now about uh, companies using data to make money and to exploit the people that uh, they're serving, but um, our mission is to do good and, and we we collect all this information to um, enhance our platform to better serve people. Uh, we don't violate people's privacy, we don't sell user information, and we're also HIPAA compliant, which allows us to aggregate information and share that with you. Um, all data has been anonymized, and I wanna make that really clear as we get, get into it.
now let's talk about who's using one degree. So we're going to dive into specific demographics, but um, if you could create a, a typical community member, it would be a Latin ex woman with one or more children between the ages of 25 and 44 years old who is or was homeless, uses a mobile phone, and lives in either San Francisco or Los Angeles County. And this would be sort of a composite community member of one degree. So we launched in the Bay Area about six years ago, um, and we launched in Los Angeles County just over one year ago, but it represents almost a third of our membership already, or a third of our community um, using One Degrees platform. 63% um, of our community lives in either San Francisco or Los Angeles County. 75% of our community is people of color, and that closely maps to low-income populations in major urban areas, um, which is uh, disproportionately people of color. And while our platform does skew younger, you can see that that is um, between uh, the ages of, well, uh, 18 and 44. Um, that's not surprising given that we're a technology platform. But what was really surprising to us when we looked at this data and we asked our members who they were, almost a quarter are actually over 55 years old. And I think that demonstrates the, the, the shrinking digital divide uh, among generations. And our community is primarily women, as you can see, 74% identify as female. 56%, so over half of households using one degree have uh, at least one child under the age of 18 in the household. This is really striking to us when we asked our members. So 26% identify as currently homeless who use one degree. Uh, that's a staggering number. And um, less than one, one third of our member, membership, our community at large said that they have never experienced homelessness. Um, this was really striking and, and to us represents the very real needs of a growing population across our state. And then more than half of our community is on uh, mobile devices, so a phone or a tablet. And this was really not surprising to us given the, the trends that we've seen in other contextual research that has been done on this work. So um, this was no surprise to us. And I just want to do a quick reminder that if you have any questions during this presentation, uh, please use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen and type a question in the box that pops up. Um, Andrea, who you just heard from earlier, is monitoring this, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we have we can at the end, and um, we'll uh, we'll follow up if we if we can answer them during the presentation. And we're also tweeting from at one deg uh, excuse me at one deg on Twitter. Uh, Anisha is working on that right now, so if you want to interact with us on there, please uh, please tweet at us through that and use the hashtag Big Data for Good and tag us if you tweet us. Okay, so let's dive into some of our some of our findings, our research findings. So, so first, um, our most searched categories in the Bay Area, uh, housing is far and away the top resource need. Again, not surprising at all. We are in a statewide housing crisis, but it's acutely felt in the Bay Area. Um, and you can see that there are a number of other uh, resource categories that uh, is are pretty popular. Um, family and household represents uh, a variety of uh, household needs like diapers or clothes, and then food, health, education, and so on. And then in Los Angeles County, um, this is just by contrast, um, housing is also a, a big need in Los Angeles area. Again, this is a statewide crisis for facing, um, but also there are uh, other needs um, bubble the top a little bit higher. So emergency needs have um, are apparently uh, more popular in the Los Angeles County area. So diving into some of our findings around um, search terms. So uh, what we found in analyzing our data is that there is a um, there's above average correlation between people who are looking for um, housing search resources and affordable home ownership. And to us, this suggests that the term 
home ownership uh, is still seen by many as a way to find stability in their housing situation, despite the fact that that home ownership itself is largely unattainable to low-income families, and frankly, to many, many and most middle-income families um, in certainly in the Bay Area and, and Los Angeles County. And then the other interesting finding was that Section 8, the term Section 8, was actually a very popular search term, and um, to us, this this was actually um, searched more widely searched than the terms housing vouchers and depend, uh, deposit and rent assistance. And this to us indicates that Section 8 has really become, over the course of many decades, synonymous with housing assistance in general, despite the fact that Section 8 itself is a very limited availability as a program. Um, most families are not, are not able to access Section 8 vouchers. The wait lists open up on a very limited basis. Um, so we believe that this term essentially is a proxy for other types of housing assistance, and vouchers, and, and, and rent assistance. Moving on to uh, food searches, we know, uh, as I'm sure many on this call know, CalFresh is the name in California for the SNAP program, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, that um, is formerly known as food stamps. And what we found is that the term uh, food stamps is actually much more popular, actually the fourth most searched food-related term. And this is far and away uh, above the term CalFresh, which is actually really only has been searched a trivial number of times by people on one degree. To us, this indicates that the term food stamps is still really the colloquial name that people are looking for when they're thinking of this MAP program. And it remains resonant and popular. And CalFresh still remains um, mostly a, a term that's, that's jargon for professionals. And then, we can also use our data to look at really interesting and valuable insights on the neighborhood level. So in San Francisco's Bayview neighborhood, which is a neighborhood in the southeastern part of San Francisco um, that, is, um, that uh, has, uh, has a higher um, low-income population than other parts of the city, um, and has very well-publicized and well-known um, transit access issues, for example, this article, recent article, and then actually, uh, bunch of coverage in the media just last week on some major transit problems in the neighborhood. Um, the, the term or the um, resource need transit passes and discounts actually surpassed housing search as a top resource need in this neighborhood uh, alone. And this is compared to every other neighborhood in San Francisco and uh, where we don't find that to be the case. So transit passes and discounts actually um, is, uh, is the most popular search term in this neighborhood. And, um, that really maps closely to the reality of people living in the neighborhood. In San Francisco's South of Market neighborhood, where I'm actually speaking from you today, we, this is where One Degree's office is. Um, it, um, it has a really acute street homelessness crisis. And what we found is that people searching for affordable housing, the term affordable housing in SOMA, are much more likely to also be searching for homeless support services compared to other neighborhoods in San Francisco. And this just, this just bears out in uh, the reality that we see every day. And then in San Francisco's uh, Mission neighborhood, which has, has, has an especially large uh, Latinx population, we see that more people here are searching in the immigration law and ESL classes categories and um, are adding things to their, um, to their own one degree counts from those categories. Um, this is disproportionate to every other neighborhood in the, in the city. And it is, um, it's not surprising. We also are able to look at seasonal spikes of resource needs. And we, this allows us to, to be able to track real time trends and see and where there are spikes in demand uh, for, for different categories. So for instance, in, in August, the lead up to students going back to school, um, school supplies, bumps up to the eighth most searched category, and whereas it's not even the top 20 most searched categories the rest of the year. It's just behind food and food pantries in August. And then November, meals moves up from 17 to the first most searched category um, in November. And in December, um, where families have started to think about how to source gifts for their kids, um, we see that toys becomes the third most searched resource need um, across the board. 
where it's not even it's not in the top 20 searches the rest of the year. It's interesting to think about how we can use this, this kind of real-time data. I'll talk a little bit more later, but just to give you a real-world example of how we apply this, uh, a lot of the wait lists for, or a lot of the, the organizations that are offering free toys and gifts and meals um, require signups. And in order to ensure that our community has access to those resources, we actually, now that we know that people are searching for those things later in December, even though um, if they wait until December, they'll miss those deadlines, we, um, we actually send them in advance um, notices in weeks, weeks before those signups close so families can actually access them. So we actually use this real-time data in very real ways to alert our community. We are also able to look at the diversity of resource needs. So 67% of people have two or more resource needs. So what this means is essentially someone is looking for uh, food pantries, but they're also looking for employment, for instance. And this actually varies pretty widely depending on what overall resource area they're looking for. So for example, um, the top line uh, resource categories of housing, food, employment, et cetera, um, within those those areas, we actually see differences and, and higher diversity in some areas. So for instance, so someone who's looking in an employment category is actually 77% um, likely that they will also be looking for some a resource in some other area like food or health or housing, thus indicating that uh, there's a higher level of need if you're looking for employment resources, for instance. In the San Francisco Bay Area and Los Angeles County, we see um, the diversity of needs across the board. Um, and what is interesting of this, of this data, um, if you compare the counties, is that there's actually 40% um, 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 fewer, excuse me, 50% more people are searching for five or more uh, different resources in Los Angeles County than in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, this was meaningful to us because it shows that um, a hub of information like one degree is really essential to help people find the resources that they need on a variety of different um, um, in a variety of different resource categories. I want to talk through a couple of real world scenarios. So this data is anonymized. This is um, these are real um, behavioral data points I'm going to walk through, and this this represents a, a, a user's uh, or, or a community member's journey um, through using One Degree's platform. So I'm going to start with our community member Anna, whose name has been changed. Um, she is uh, female identifying. She's in her 30s. She's English speaking, and she lives in San Francisco. And Anna has um, actually started her journey on One Degree by downloading our iPhone app, and she searched for paying for healthcare, food stamps, groceries, and then also divorce and family law. She tells us um, that she uh, is interested in uh, divorce and legal separation resource in Contra Costa County by stating it to her plan. Two days later, Anna reports to us via SMS, so via text message, that she used the resource for the divorce and separation legal assistance in Contra Costa. And then she goes on back to her iPhone, or excuse me, back to the iOS app um, and searches for grocery resources as well. Looking at another member, a Tatiana, who is female identifying, she's 25 years old, she's Spanish speaker and lives in Los Angeles County. So Tatiana starts her uh, one degree path by going to our website, so onedegree.org. She searched for resources for savings, so like, um, like money savings and added resources to a collection, which is a way for people to um, group resources that they might wanna share or be interested in the future. Two months later, we didn't hear from her, but two months later she comes back and searched for home safety resources and then added a note for herself on that resource to remind herself of something um, when she comes back. So we didn't hear from her at all. And then uh, eight months later, she downloaded our Android app and she started searching for uh, homeless support um, services. And she ends up um, then one week later searching for public benefits and job search and placement. And she ended up indicating to us through some behavioral data that she ended up accessing that resource or 
at least reaching out to the, the organization offering that benefit and service. And then my last example is um, Arturo. He's a male identifying, 60 years old, or in his 60s, excuse me, and is English speaking, and he lives in Contra Costa County here in the Bay Area. Arturo signed up on OneDegree.org on our website and searched for shelters, deposit and rent assistance, and renter's insurance. He went on to add three resources to a collection so he, for him to stay later on, and these were sh different shelters and uh, resources to help him find affordable housing. Two weeks later, he reported via our website as having been unsuccessful at using one of the resources that he found in that first search, and he actually left a rating review of that resource, and I thought gave a, a very um, helpful review for the community to understand um, some constructive criticism about it. And then, he went on to search for payment assistance as well, so payment uh, for uh, bills, for instance. So we didn't hear from him, and then two weeks later he comes back, and he added a note to a resource he saved um, about a waitlist that he joined, and this was potentially a confirmation number from adding, uh, being added to the waitlist um, or other information to help him in the future. Two days later, he comes back and searches again for deposit and rent assistance, and now, and as you can see in sort of the evolution of his search and, um, and struggle, is he is now searching for eviction prevention. And then two days later, he comes back and searches for unemployment services, and this is on our website. And then he also responds to a text message and uh, reports back to us on, on his status. And then came back a day later, and back on our website and searches for more eviction prevention services. And that was Arturo's journey. So you can really see both the diversity of needs, the, the scope of, of how he used our platform, both through website, Android app, SMS, um, and then also his path and the evolution of his needs. So how do we use this data and how can we put this all to work? So we have, we've developed some ideas about how we can use this kind of data to improve our systems thinking and improve the safety net. We wanna hear from you about what you're thinking and your questions, so uh, don't forget to um, ask a question in that Q&A button at the bottom. But here's some things that we're thinking about. So um, we are able to see on a very granular level, the neighborhood level, um, when needs are changing and when there are spikes for uh, resources. And um, for instance, um, we can actually identify um, when there are acute needs. If we see a, all of a sudden we see a spike for addiction um, services or opioid addiction service, services in a particular neighborhood, it would be interesting and, and, and probably helpful to know what was going on in that neighborhood to, to see such a spike. Um, we can also promote programs at different times of the year when the need is highest, and I showed some examples of that with toys and meals. Um, and we do this really to get ahead of uh, where families need to be um, so that they don't miss out on really important opportunities that can um, smooth income or help them with food insecurity at really tough times of the year. We can also use this data to identify resource gaps, meaning that um, when we see that there are, for instance, a lot of searches for um, and people looking for resources in um, a particular city or neighborhood for free diapers. Um, we, we know whether or not there are actually diaper resources in a particular neighborhood, or we would know if, for instance, um, the families are looking for diapers in, let's say, Martinez, but the closest diaper resource is actually 40 miles away across the county. Um, that would be really important information for organizations to know who are serving um, who are serving families and, and also for potentially funders who are looking to meet resource gaps. And then we also use this data on a very practical level uh, day to day here at One Group Three. We look for um, what people are searching for, what are the terms people are using, and we help use that information to inform um, how we um, design our categorization, our products, um, and, and, and how we can make it just as easy as possible for people to find what they're looking for without having to re rely on jargon or uh, knowing having the organization names in their head of what they're looking for. 
and then finally, we, we also can use this data and, and build on uh, the accountability that people um, bring to the system by, by really um, speaking out about the resources that they're using and how things are going, um, both um, in praise of an organization when things are going well and um, helping inform the community that something's really valuable and important, and then also when there are shortcomings or when an organization can improve a service or better meet a need, um, we can use that information as well. So with that, I'm, I'm going to uh, turn back over to Andrea and see if we've got any questions. Andrea, do you wanna? Yeah. Yeah, we've gotten yeah. a couple of good a couple of good questions. So, um, one question, Eric, I think um, you could answer is sort of the breakdown of mobile users across either Android or Apple, um, and are there any insights of um, uh, from from these uh, from the two user groups of of the different operating systems on one degree? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. What we see is that on the web, we actually see a pretty even 50-50 split between Android and iOS users. And um, that we, we see um, on our mobile apps at the moment that there is about um, uh, twice the number of Android users than iOS users. So um, what, that's, what I mean by that split is that uh, when people are actually just using our website on their mobile phone, we see that as an even split. Um, but the actual apps themselves are being uh, more heavily weighted towards Android at the moment. Great. And then there was a um, a good point raised about whether the term food stamps might actually be indicative of the age of our clients or whether that is something that is um, related to the long-term nature of their um, of their poverty situation, and it would be mm. interesting to know how long clients have been in need that use one degree. Are are does one degree have are our users newer to um, poverty, or have they been facing long term a long time need? Um, uh, mm. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Eric. I would say we don't have enough data to really say um, longitudinally how um, you know how our member or how our community has um, how long they've been experiencing um, poverty or or being at risk. Um, what we have seen is um, that we have I think it was um, don't want to let me see if I can quickly go back to the slide. that we see that about 32% um, of our community um, says that they've been homeless in the past um, and 5% identify as being at risk of homelessness. Um, so we do see that um, there is some sort of long-term um, dealing with um, poverty or homelessness um, and, um, and members are still looking for, and our, our community is still looking for resources. Um, so I would say I don't, I don't know um, across the board on average, how long people have been struggling or looking for uh, resources, but we do see a pretty broad spectrum of people who are both um, both uh, currently experiencing a, a situation or, or have in the past. Um, so sort of half answers your question, sorry. No, that's good, thanks, thanks Eric. And then we've got mm -hmm. a couple more questions coming in. Um, one is, you know, what are some ways that maybe one degree can take action on spikes in searches or if um, you could dive in a little more to how we, um, how we might address spikes in, um, for example, addiction searches within a particular organization. Um, there's an idea presented that maybe we can reach out to organizations in that area or, um, you know, maybe there are other, other actions um, that we could take as a platform. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. There's, I think, lots of different ways that we could use this information to help address acute needs. I think there are opportunities to partner with organizations that serve specific areas or neighborhoods and make sure that they're aware of spikes. And um, we could also 
reach out to um, if, if the people in these neighborhoods, uh, you know, in a neighborhood that has a spike um, has, um, if they have one degree accounts, we can reach out and find out what's going on um, and try to get more of an on the ground um, first person perspective about, about what, what's happening. Um, I think that there are a lot of different ways we can use this information. Um, also on the hi uh, higher level, uh, like a funder level, I think um, it, it can be helpful to um, potentially reroute resources to organizations or neighborhoods where there are needs and um, be able to better inform projects um, versus doing a more sort of broad, broad based um, request for proposal. Like what, what are the, what are uh, the very specific you need that we can address with, um, with targeted funding? I think there are lots of different opportunities. Yeah, and there, um, thanks, Eric. There are a couple of questions about um, accountability and reviews. So there's a question about um, sort of how, how many reviews there are on the site, what proportion, and then mm -hmm. there's a related question about whether there is an accountability function on the site. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, do we provide that feedback to organizations or um, do we have any evidence of organizations responding to feedback or or reviews? Great, great question. question. Yeah, it is a great question. We get it all the time. And I would say this is like actually a really big learning for us as an organization over the last six years. Um, we um, actually don't emphasize ratings and reviews as part of um, the access of resources. It's something that we do as part of um, providing the community uh, a way to speak out and share their experience. Um, but it's not something that we've focused on as an organization on purpose um, because we think that it is a part of um, helping to lift up the community and improve access to resources, but that um, for everyday help seeker, um, it's really not the primary uh, service that we can offer them, um, which is to help connect them with the resources that they need um, versus trying to improve um, or, or you know, provide give back to the community, which is that we, we hope is a secondary benefit from providing a platform like this. Um, the, so we, we don't, I would say we, we have just scratched the surface with, with being able to um, you collect really great um, review reviews and um, really helpful feedback from community members using services. Um, definitely have just started that kind of, um, I just scratched the surface with that. So um, then the other question or the related question was around, do we provide opportunities for, for organizations to respond or um, adapt to that feedback. Um, we, uh, an organization can respond um, on one degree. There is a way to um, add a response. And that's something that organizations can do. The other thing we'd like to do, which we haven't done yet, which is to give organizations the ability to, um, well, so one thing that organizations can do now, which we strongly encourage everyone on this call and everyone who uh, uses one degree to do if they work in an organization that serves um, that serves the community um, to become an affiliate of their organization, basically claiming their organization's page on one degree. And what we haven't done, what we'd like to do is basically alert um, the affiliates of that organization when um, a community member wants to reach out to them or has feedback or um, just needs additional assistance from them. And so we'd like to we'd like to offer that in the future, but we we just haven't yet. That's great. And organizations can see the reviews. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. They're on a page. Yeah, so that, yeah, that's available to them to, to take a look at. Um, <clears throat> Eric, can you talk a little bit about um, where the data um, is coming from? Is it client searches? Is it case manager type searches? Or is it both? Yeah, we, we actually, um, for this, uh, this presentation and this analysis, we exclusively use community member or so help seeker um, searches as much as possible. Um, so um, obviously, it's, you know, potential that there's some there's some outliers in the data where someone identifies a community member, but they're actually a professional. But um, for the most part, we excluded uh, professional users from this data set, so we could really look at help seekers. Yeah, and then there's another question about. Um, um, how we define, um, I think in the in the um, the slide about San Francisco and Los Angeles top searches, there was a category called emergency. 
can you um, talk a little bit about what's included in there? There was a question about what that what those entail. I think it's our urgent category, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So if you can, you can actually go. I mean, obviously, anyone can go to onedegree.org and take a look at our um, how we categor categorize information. Um, we also I didn't mention, but we also have a uh, basically an explainer website called socialservicedata.org, and that is um, socialservicedata.org. And you can take a look at how we categorize information. It um, tells you about um, what information we add and why, um, how we try to um, write and synthesize information on our website and uh, the taxonomy we use. And it's completely uh, open source. Feel free to use it um, and give us feedback on it. We have a regular process. I think I see a question here about um, what's our, um, how do we take this inf take uh, feedback from the community and, and adapt um, adapt our data? And we have a couple different ways we do that. Um, we on the on the day to day level, you can use our tools to report that information to us or edit information directly. Um, and if you have feedback on at a higher level on like our taxonomy or how do we categorize things uh, and as a whole, um, you can also give us feedback about that. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we have a regular process to review um, feedback we get about our categorization, including looking at this kind of data and how people are actually searching. Um, but also we've partnered with professionals um, to make sure that we're reflecting categories in a way that makes sense to people and helps people find things quickly. So we're always open to changing that. Um, this is not a, uh, it's not, um, a one uh, and all be all. Um, we're very, very happy to <clears throat> take feedback and try to make it better. Yeah, and on a just a really practical level, it's um, the urgent category includes crisis hotlines, suicide hotlines, abuse hotlines, um, emergency shelter, things like that. Yeah, sorry, um, didn't answer that question directly, but thanks for thanks for sharing. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Eric, um, Brad asked a question, which is, do we actually measure matching efficiency so meaning are we measuring how useful services are that people find versus just whether they find what they're you know what they're searching for that they that the search was successful but that they actually were able to utilize the resource that was useful to them yeah we sure do we we just um this year we started measuring uh, what we call the utilization of services, and we ask individuals to report back to us um, whether or not they um, use a service, and and then following that, um, I was sort of alluding to asking them for feedback about that service. But um, yeah, we and we ask that through the full range of our products. So from the website, um, you can report back to us about whether or not you use something. Um, you, you can proactively use the website. You can use our our apps and and um, and respond. I, I showed a screenshot of that earlier of um, of, uh, of reporting that to us. Um, we also proactively ask you over if we have your cell phone, where we'll send you a text, and you can respond to us through an automated way about um, whether or not you use a service. So we have a couple of different ways in which um, we try to track that. We're seeing about a 15 to 20 percent um, rate of people telling us that they use a resource. Um, it's pretty early data. Um, we're still at the early stages of collecting and and, um, and and learning about what does it mean when people report back to us about that? Are they reporting accurately? Is it what they think that they're, are they saying what they think that, that we think they're saying to us? Um, so we're still learning about that, but what we're seeing is that, uh, you know, between 15 and 20 percent of people are actually, um, or sorry, it's higher than that. Um, that's just the that's just successes. So um, over 20 percent of people reporting back to us in some way, um, we think is a um, really good first step. And um, we're going to, um, we're going to be exploring how how do we make that even um, uh, clearer data for us and um, and uh, and try to measure that over the long term. Great, and just a couple more final questions here. These are some really good questions coming in. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah. So the question about proximity, which when I first saw the data come in um, and we started this analysis, I also had this question about whether it's um, possible for us to actually see how far clients have to travel for services or whether um, this is something that 
we could um, maybe we could do an analysis in the future. Hmm. That is, that's really interesting. Um, we, we have been done that kind of analysis specifically, and I think we would probably want more, um, try, to get, try to get more granular on um, where people, what the people's location is. We have, in some cases, broader, uh, sort of broader location data about people um, that isn't, that won't uh, give us, I think, a specific enough picture to be able to do that analysis at the moment. But I think that would be really interesting to have. have. Um, I did mention earlier, and I think this gets, at, gets to part of that, is being able to analyze um, if someone is looking for, I mentioned the diaper resource example, but, but really any type of resource, if someone is looking for, um, uh, you know, uh, or perhaps a ESL class or a peer support uh, group, and the closest one is actually 30 miles away. We can, we would be able to know that, but, but maybe not if uh, someone's location wasn't as accurate. Um, so we do, we, we have start, started that data, but um, it would be really interesting to be able to, to do that um, in the future. Great, thanks. And then um, two final questions. Um, there's a good one here about how we actually keep all of our resource information up to date. Ah, great question. Well, we have a, a fantastic team here at One Degree that um, that uh, basically is a, a team of people who who add and update the resource information on a regular basis. Um, it's it's uh, it's a lot of hard work, <laughs> and uh, we also uh, so we try to guarantee and make sure that that information is um, is updated and reviewed by a human being, um, and on a, on at least annual biannual uh, uh, twice a year basis. Um, for most popular resources, and the um, we also have a, uh, a suite of self-service tools. So it's sort of like Wikipedia, where anyone in the community can add and update resources on one degree. Uh, we uh, strongly encourage um, anyone who is using one degree that um, has that kind of knowledge, so usually a professional or a practitioner, um, to add and update information. And then our team will review that information and, and uh, give it one more, uh, one more review before it gets published. So there's a little more quality control than Wikipedia, but um, in a sense that everyone can add and edit, sort of like that. Um, so we have a variety of ways in which we keep things up to date, but um, primarily human beings. And there's a, um, a good segue question and to wrap up, which is, do we provide this kind of granular information to government? We would really love to, to be able to do that. We have, I mentioned the suite of tools we have for reporting um, and um, Los Angeles County Department of Health Services is using um, our reports uh, in this way um, as, part of, um, as part of that relationship. Um, and we have a number of other uh, plus customers that are using our reporting tools. Um, this sort of granular data analysis is something that uh, we've only been able to do once just simply because of capacity in our size but we'd love to be able to do um, more routine, um, higher level data analysis like this in the future. So we would love to and be able to provide to government um, and it would be um, definitely, um, definitely something we'd like to do. Um, we just uh, need the opportunity and the time. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. And thank you everybody for being so engaged and asking really great questions. Um, we see this really is just the beginning uh, for us, this was the first time that we've done this kind of um, big data analysis and had enough data after several years um, of providing a one degree platform to our communities. We're gonna be releasing the report this week uh, on Medium, so look out for that. We'll also make sure and send everybody um, a link to the recording and the slides. And we really think we're just beginning to scratch the surface of the platform data and how it might help us all to serve low-income families better. So please do reach out to us um, if you have ideas about how we could put this data to work, if you have conferences or events where you think it would be useful to share or provide this kind of information. And um, let us know if this sparks any big ideas for you. Um, we're all in this together to make the social services sector work better for families. Um, we want to thank you for joining the webinar today. Um, we're going to share everything out to you 
And also there's going to be a survey sent out by email um, tomorrow. Uh, and that's a wrap. Thank you everybody for your time and attention. We really appreciate it.